And good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Disability Competent Care webinar on serving adults on the autism spectrum. My name is Jesse Mikulik, and I'll be getting us started today. Should you have any questions now or throughout the presentation, please feel free to enter them into the Q&A feature on your platform. We'll be addressing your content-related questions during the discussion portion of this webinar. The Lewin Group, under contract with the CMS Medicare and Medicaid Coordination Office, partnered with Christopher Duff and other disability practice experts to develop the 2018 Disability Competent Care webinar series. This webinar series builds on the 2017 DCC webinar series that introduced the model of care and its seven foundational pillars. You can view the series and related resources at the Resources for Integrated Care website, the link of which is on your screen. As I mentioned, the webinar will be interactive with 45 minutes of presenter-led discussion, followed by a 15-minute presenter and participant question and answer session. We'll also be including video replay and the slide presentation um, at our website listed on your screen. We're pleased to be able to offer credits for continuing education units and continuing medical education for this webinar. The accreditation is listed on your screen now. To receive the credit, the post-test must be completed through the CMS Learning Management System with a score of 80% or higher by midnight on March 19, 2018. Further information on this process is available at the Resources for Integrated Care website, and we'll be including that after the presentation as well. This webinar is supported through MMCO to help beneficiaries enrolled in Medicare and Medicaid to have access to seamless, high-quality health care that includes the full range of covered services in both programs. To support providers in their efforts to deliver more integrated, coordinated care to Medicare and Medicaid enrollees, MMCO is developing technical assistance and actionable tools based on successful innovations in care models, such as this webinar. To learn more about current efforts and resources, you can visit our website, the link on your screen. I'll now hand the presentation over to your moderator, Chris Duff. Thank you, Jesse. And I would also like to welcome everyone to the second webinar in the 2018 series. I'm a disability practice and policy consultant who's been working with the Lewin Group to develop the disability competent care model and related webinars and materials. I am especially excited about this webinar, for I have minimal experience in working with um, autistic persons, and I have joined a great deal. I have learned a great deal in working with the presenters along the way. I will be joined today by two speakers that I will introduce in the order of their presentation. First will be Dr. Christina Nicolaitis. She is Professor and Senior Scholar in Social Determinants of Health at Portland State University and Adjunct Associate Professor at Oregon State and Science University. As a general internist and health services researcher, she has focused most of her career on improving the health care of marginalized populations, including autistic adults. Dr. Nicolaitis is the co-founder and co-director of the Academic Autism Spectrum Partnership in Research and Education that goes by the acronym ASPIRE, a national NIH-funded partnership that brings together academics, autistic adults, family members, and disability and health service providers to conduct research to improve health and well-being for autistic individuals. She's also educator, editor-in-chief of a new academic journal, Autism in Health in Adulthood. Dr. Nicolaitis brings her personal experience, perspective as a clinician, as a parent of an autistic teenager, as an employer, friend, and ally of autistic adults. Following her, Joe Cappuccini will present on behalf of Masa Hussari. Masa created the slides and is the program supervisor in the Behavioral Health Department at LA Care Health Plan. Masa received a BA in psychology and an MA in behavioral clinical psychology from California State University, Northridge. And is, the, and is a board-certified behavioral analyst. She has worked with autistic persons and their families for most of her career as a direct provider of a range of services with autistic persons and their families before she joined LA Care in 2015. 
Based on her experience as a provider, she developed LA Care's Autism Services Program and currently supervises the staff overseeing the services and managing the Autism Provider Network. The learning objectives are fairly straightforward. We are focusing today on autism, a common though not well understood population by those of us in the, health, in the healthcare field or plans. As demonstrated by the number of requests we've had over the last few years for this topic. Dr. Nicolaitis will stop, will start off the presentation today with an introduction to autism, its prevalence, and related conditions. Next slide, please. She will talk about the barriers and disparities experienced by autistic adults and participant experiences and strategies for providers. She will introduce a great tool she and her colleagues developed to help participants and providers with their health care experience. Joe will follow Dr. Nicolaitis' presentation where he will share their experience developing and overseeing their autism spectrum program at LA Care. This includes information about functional behavior assessments, the evidence-based treatment for children, and their B behavior health provider network. She will, he will conclude with information about how they prepare for transitioning their members on the autism spectrum into the appropriate adult services. Before handing this over to Dr. Nicolaitis, I wanted to make a note on the differing perspectives and even philosophical approaches. You will hear from our two presenters and their work with autistic persons and their families. Though their approaches vary to a degree, they both believe in the use of interventions to help autistic persons communicate, function independently, learn effectively, obtain high quality health care, and live healthy, productive lives. Autistic persons are not broken nor needing to be fixed. Their concept is core to Dr. Nicolaitis' model and is certainly core to the DCC model, which focuses on living with the disability and aimed at training and support for functional independence. At this point, I would like to hand it over to Dr. Nicolaitis for her presentation. Great, hello, thank you for having me. Um, can we move to the next slide? Great, so um, before we start, I just wanna make a few minor notes about language. First of all, you'll hear me use the term autism and autism spectrum disorder relatively interchangeably. Um, both terms really talk about a, a complex neuro dis neurodevelopmental disability that affects social communication, sensory processing, and scope of interests. Um, you also may note that, um, or you might be surprised that I'm not using person-first language. Please understand that the, that is not out of either ignorance or disrespect, but um, by uh, respecting the wishes of my autistic partners, many of whom feel that, many of whom prefer identity first language, for example, autistic adults versus person first language. Uh, what they've explained to me is that person first language is wonderful when you're trying to separate the person from an unwanted medical condition, for example, person with HIV, person with cancer, but that, that that can feel stigmatizing to somebody who considers autism a part of their identity much in the same way that we wouldn't say person with femaleness or person with whiteness or person with homosexuality. Um, they also feel that on the autism spectrum is an acceptable alternative. Um, next slide, please. So um, just to, to, to be clear, the, um, whoops, can we have, oh, here, sorry. Um, the, the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, has been changing rapidly over the last decades, um, and that sometimes causes confusion to, uh, to providers and to the community. The latest version, DSM-5, has combined what used to be called autistic disorder, Asperger's disorder, childhood disintegrative disorder, and pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified, into this one big term called um, autism spectrum disorder. Um, one problem with 
with the word spectrum is that autism actually doesn't really manifest on a linear spectrum. Um, it's actually kind of across multiple spectra. So you might find that somebody is very strong in their verbal skills but has really hard time with their adaptive functioning, or somebody might um, um, have challenges with um, need, need for consistency but not so much with something else. Um, we have also found is that these challenges really change depending on environmental stimuli, supports, and stressors. So somebody might be able to function quite well in one environment and then put them in another environment, often the one we're seeing them in, in that they're sick, they're, 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 there's been a crisis, and they'll, they'll function very differently. We also today are talking about adults. and. People keep mature over time. This is like, I mean, no, no adult is, is like they were as children. And certainly what we find is that as, as, as autistic children turn into autistic adults, they mature just the rest of, like the rest of us do. Um, they also learn many coping skills, um, and, um, and that will also affect how they, how they function and how they present. Next slide, please. So, um, just in terms of the of the DSM, um, I just want to basically say there's two big buckets that um, that we care about. One is the um, what the DSM considers persistent deficits in social communication and social interaction. These are things um, that might, as an adult, manifest in challenges in understanding nonverbal communication or um, figuring out when it's their turn to speak or in understanding the um, social uh, cues that might present in their work environment um, or in other situations. The second big bucket is what the DSM considers restricted repetitive patterns of behaviors, interests, and other activities. And that's where we find people will have um, potentially stereotyped or repetitive motor movements, what we call stims. Um, they might have um, a great need for consistency or insistence on, on uh, sameness. What the DSM calls highly restricted fixated interests of abnormal intensity or focus, what many of us really in, in academia consider our specialties, but you'll find that adults will often have a um, high uh, degree of knowledge and interest in one one or two uh, narrow areas, and then very importantly, hyper or hypo reactivity to sensory inputs, um, and that can often really make or break our interactions um, with autistic individuals is understanding how key the sensory aspects are of the condition. Next slide, slide please. So. Um, over the, the past few decades, the prevalence of autism seems to have skyrocketed. Most, um, most people believe that that isn't actually because something has truly changed, but because we keep changing our definitions and our understanding of what autism actually is. Um, people in the baby boom generation didn't even have a chance to be considered autistic as children because it wasn't even in the DSM. Our Gen Xers, um, we didn't even have Asperger's in the DSM until uh, 1995. Um, so as you can see, we've mostly been uh, looking at, at today's version of autism in the children that were born in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, that group of children has um, grown up now and are entering adulthood, but that doesn't mean that there haven't always been autistic adults there. Uh, a large, well-conducted um, population-based study uh, that really just went and did new diagnoses door-to-door uh, -door, found approximately a 1% prevalence of, of autism in, uh, in the adult population with no change in age. Um, what uh, we do know is that there's continued underdiagnosis of autism in women of any age and in people of, of color, and that will see probably change, I'm hoping, over the next, um, uh, next few years. Next slide, please. So um, as a healthcare provider, especially as an adult healthcare provider, I'm rarely in the position of treating autism per se, what I'm often treating or looking out for are associated conditions. There's a growing literature on conditions that are associated with autism, um, which include epilepsy, 
um, uh, especially in in, um, in participants with uh, co-occurring um, intellectual disabilities, uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, and multiple other gastrointestinal conditions, feeding and nutrition problems, metabolic syndromes, and a very, very high prevalence of anxiety, depression, sleep disorders, and unfortunately, suicidality. We're also starting to get new information, um, as well as many anecdotal concerns around post-traumatic stress symptoms associated with the childhood treatments we're giving, um, for example, such as um, applied behavioral analysis. Um, we also know that the um, autistic individuals have a higher risk of experiencing violence and abuse. Um, and unfortunately, all of this put together amounts to a reduced life expectancy, um, which we find is largely driven by um, seizures um, and, uh, and suicide, as well as poor care for the many other um, uh, co-occurring conditions. Next slide, please. So um, important to, things to, uh, to think about is not to stereotype people uh, on the spectrum. Um, if you look at uh, current media, we have quite a lot of images of what it is to be autistic. There's an adage around you've met one autistic, if, 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 you've, if you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person, and there's really quite a, a, a lot of variation. The other thing is that though we're talking about autism in a clinical context, um, we do have to remember that autistic traits can be both strengths and challenges. Um, as I mentioned earlier, what can be considered an abnormality of a restrictive interest can actually be great expertise in an area um, or what could you know, or could, for example, help somebody manage their chronic illnesses because they use their con their, their consistency for good. Um, similarly, I often find that um, people expect that. Um, that autistic individuals will not only have these stereotypical traits, but will also have these savant-type um, um, uh, qualities. And again, that uh, is not true. Um, some do, but certainly some don't, and that can be harmful. Um, and then finally, um, though autism is defined as a social communication disability, it doesn't actually mean that people shy away for so from social interactions. Um, they just have very different interactions, and many may maintain strong friendships and relationships. I can tell you my closest friend in the world is uh, an autistic adult, and though it might be a really bad idea to take her to a cocktail party, uh, that doesn't mean that she can't actually have true friendships, um, have two fr true friendships and, and really be there as much as a support to me as I am to her. Next slide. So um, I'd like to move a little bit more now to uh, healthcare. Um, as, a, as a healthcare provider, I'm very well aware of how challenging it can be for me to uh, uh, provide optimal care to my patients on the autism spectrum. Uh, next slide, please. So before we even talk about um, uh, uh, about um, uh, autism. We need to just talk about disability, and I can't imagine that anyone listening to this talk today doesn't know that social issues greatly impact health and healthcare. Um, the large literature um, that um, that shows that disability status uh, and health disparities are often associated with poor performance on measures that are linked to value-based purchasing payment uh, pro purchase program payments. Um, and we know that people with disabilities in general experience worse health outcomes, experience difficulties or delays in receiving necessary health care, have limited knowledge or access to sexual health information. Um, and sadly, again, as we're talking about adults, we find that there's this huge service cliff as um, children with disabilities transition from adolescence to adulthood. Next slide. So in my own work, um, we, my colleagues and I did a, a survey um, quite a number of years ago in 2013 comparing autistic adults to non-autistic adults with and without other disabilities. And we found that autistic adults reported greater unmet health care needs. In particular, they reported greater unmet physical health needs, mental health needs, and prescription medication needs. They also had a 
greater use of emergency of the emergency department, which to me really signifies a failure of our primary care system. We also found that they had lower use of preventative services such as pap smear and overall lower satisfaction with patient provider communication and with healthcare with their own ability to manage their healthcare or what we call healthcare self efficacy. Next slide. Um, also in another study that my colleagues and I did, um, we found that that people without disabilities exper experienced fewer barriers to health care in general compared to autistic people and people with other disabilities. But then when we specifically looked at autistic people, we, they, they reported different barriers to health care than people with other disabilities in a greater number of them. Um, and overall, their, 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 their utilization reflected a different pattern of health care usage. Um, in our study, at least, the top barriers that autistic people um, described um, or endorsed were fear or anxiety, um, feeling that they can't process information fast enough in real time, um, concerns about cost, um, they were concerned that facilities uh, caused all sorts of sensory issues that then impacted their ability to actually um, uh, interact with their providers, and then they um, not surprisingly mentioned uh, great difficulty in communicating with providers. Next slide. So um, for this next section, I'm going to focus on a qualitative study my colleagues and I did, uh, truly, really trying to understand more in depth the experiences of autistic adults, their supporters, and their primary care providers. Next slide. We heard lots of stories. Some were positive, some were quite negative. But overall, what we found is that the success of a healthcare interaction really depended on an interplay between different factors. And we, were, we grouped the factors into multiple levels. Um, first of all, there were the typical participant level factors, things that uh, we would expect with autism, their verbal communication skills, um, their atypical nonverbal communication, their sensory sensitivities, their challenges with body awareness, the slow processing speed, things that, again, we had heard of before. What we found, however, is that those things really mattered in relation to what the provider was, was doing. So we had a number of provider level factors, such as the no knowledge and incorrect assumptions about autism, the provider's willingness to provide accommodations, and the provider's skill in incorporating care partners. And then, of course, all of this happens in the larger context of system-level factors, um, which included the availability of formal and informal supports, the complexities of our healthcare system, um, and accessibility and stigma. And then, of course, all of this also gets impacted by the very well-known uh, socioeconomic factors. Um, so um, all our participants, but especially duly eligible participants, may also experience additional barriers, you know, for example, things like transportation, housing, nutrition, and so on. Next slide. So um, this is, I'm just going to highlight a few of the things that to me um, really were very telling. First of all, I keep making note of these sensory sensitivities. Um, this is um, a quote from one of, our, uh, one of our study participants. She says, the lights in the office were very bright, and that is exacerbated by the white walls. Sometimes the waiting rooms are crowded, and I cannot filter out the background of people talking or shuffling magazines. I feel disoriented by being led down long hallways to different rooms. I'm not able to bring up my concerns because it is all I can manage to figure out what the doctor is saying so I can respond to his questions. But he refills my usual meds and I go on my way. Next slide. We also heard quite a lot about body awareness, which again as a provider is important for me to remember. Um, people uh, said things like, um, like when, I ask, when they ask if the pain is shooting or stabbing or burning, it's like, I don't know, it just feels funny. Or the problem is it's difficult for me to isolate specific sources of pain and identify duration and intensity. It's sort of like the equivalent of white noise. Next slide. Um, I was unfortunately very saddened to hear how many times providers um, failed to um, accommodate um, uh, um, accommodate patients or, or um, 
uh, or understand their autism. As this participant said, um, I've used my Alpha Smart when my uh, when my speech is too slow or difficult to understand for medical appointments. Some of the doctors have been really great, but others have acted really condescending when I used it, sometimes assuming I needed a parent present. So I try to go without even when my speech is in poorer shape. Or as another uh, participant said, Usually, when I demonstrate a large vocabulary or some fundamentals, my needs, especially around communication, are then ignored. My choice is then to pretend to be less intelligent and accept their infantilism, or to be confused, frustrated, and stressed out. Next slide. Um, uh, similarly, um, another participant said, um, I prefer and find it easier to communicate in text, but with every doctor I speak to, they wave away the note card and look at me to ask me the same question I have just answered and interpret my confusion as my being noncompliant with the medicine. I wish healthcare providers would read the notes I make for them. Or as another participant said, uh, uh, this one is actually a supporter talking about uh, trying to support her adult son in healthcare interactions. Um, but they talk to him in the same words they'd use if they were talking to me. If they're going to talk to him, they need to say it and how he can understand it. Next slide. And then largely, um, what we often found is that due to the various communication dis um, uh, problems, due to the breakdowns of um, offering accommodations, patients often felt that they had uh, been deprived of their patient autonomy. For example, as this participant said, um, just because I might need more information to understand things, it doesn't mean that they can or should just talk to me like a child or leave me without knowledge of my own health. My body is my body, and my experiences and wishes about my body are mine to make. Next slide. Um, I largely work one-on-one -on -one with patients in, um, in my exam room. However, much of what um, is happening is really outside of my exam room, and I'm hoping that at least some of those of you on this call can actually help with the larger system. Um, we've heard story after story about how difficult it is really for anyone to manage our crazy health system, but especially for somebody with executive functioning um, challenges or other things related to autism. Um, as this young woman explained, um, I wish they understood how easy it is to get confused with all the administrative hoops a patient has to jump through to get help. It sounds pathetic at my age, but I need someone to hold my hand. I don't know what I'm doing, but nobody understands that I need that, and there is definitely nobody willing to do it. Next slide. So um, we've heard a lot from patients about their um, concerns with the healthcare system. As a provider, I can tell you part of it's also that we just don't get the training. I, I don't think I had a word about autism in anywhere in my medical school residency or fellowship uh, experience, and that is not unusual. Um, a study done down at Kaiser Permanente in Northern California um, found oops, I'm sorry, um, found that 77% uh, of healthcare providers uh, rated their, um, their um, skills in providing care to autistic adults as poor or only fair. Um, and, um, and multiple other studies have, have shown that um, providers really don't have the, the, the skills training or confidence in, in taking care of their uh, adult patients. Um, the other thing I can say as a provider is very challenging is that the people on the spectrum really vary so greatly. So it's very hard to have, you know, a short little training say, okay, this is what you have to do to take care of an autistic adult, when in fact one of my patients may be, you know, an engineer and the other one of my patients may be nonverbal and um, living with 24-hour support. Um, so um, it's really important for us to think about um, individualized patient level um, accommodations, which is what we'll be talking about uh, further uh, in the talk today. Next slide. So again, given the context that we can't just make accommodations that work for everybody, I still wanted to um, give some examples of things that health providers and health systems can do. So for example, before of, of, um, a visit, 
it's perfectly reasonable to ask staff to inform the participant about what's likely to happen during the visit, enable the participant to, pr to procure pictures of the office and our staff. For my own child when he was younger, I would just go the day before or the week before and take pictures of things. And just having been able to show him the pictures um, made such a difference in him being able to tolerate a visit. Um, generally, we do, you know, I know time is money and I know time is, is, is really challenging and I struggle with time, but we often do need to schedule longer appointments. Um, we also avoid rescheduling appointments, something that might be um, just a minor deal to somebody else may be really a huge problem to a patient or to a participant who really needs consistency. Um, in the waiting room, notify the participant about how long they'll wait um, and, um, and check in with them. And then encourage participants to prepare notes in advance about what they wish to discuss um, and ident identify and, and document participants' sensory sensitivities. So for example, when um, a medical assistant is rooming a patient, they can, they can room them in a room that has natural lighting as opposed to the fluorescent lights, which are such a problem for many of our um, autistic participants. Next slide. Similarly, during a visit, um, providers can do things to help. For example, make a problem list with a participant, um, show equipment to a participant before using it, or do a trial run of difficult exams and procedures. Um, you know, I make all sorts of, of recommendations. Actually show them what you want them to do before they leave the office. And then give time to process what's been said. Uh, sometimes it's in the visits. Sometimes we actually need to break visits into multiple visits. And then again, accommodating um, sensory sensitivities. Next slide. So um, I'm going to move on to talking about um, the autism, the Aspire uh, um, Healthcare Toolkit, um, which is uh, something we've been working on as a team now for several years. Um, can move on to the next slide. So um, the Aspire Healthcare Toolkit is. is was created as a part of this ongoing research project with my research team, Aspire. Um, we've used a community-based participatory research approach whereby we as researchers work with autistic adults, people who support individuals on the autism spectrum, and with healthcare providers and disability providers in every phase of the research project. Um, the, 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 we've created a toolkit that is basically separated into uh, two different parts. One is for patients and supporters, and the other is for healthcare providers. Um, and we can move to the next, uh, the next slide. So the provider part of the website um, is meant for both providers and staff, certainly. I'm, I'm hoping it would be helpful for um, uh, people who are working outside the healthcare system too in, 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 in supporting people um, with their health care. Um, it offers materials, resources, and practical information to help providers offer high quality primary care. Um, that part of, this, um, of the toolkit is broken down into four segments, including inf autism information, um, diagnosis information and referrals, um, a lot of details around specific um, uh, strategies uh, and accommodations we can do to care for participants on the autism spectrum, and then some sections about legal and ethical considerations and, and various uh, resources. Next slide. Um, the patient um, and supporter part of the website um, is really intended to help patients um, advocate for themselves as best as possible and be activated uh, to, um, to manage the health system. It offers information and detailed instructions, um, 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 uh, all of which has been um, edited very carefully by my team of autistic partners to really make sure that the language is accessible uh, and specific enough to, to, to deal with the language pragmatic issues that often come up with autism. Um, that part of the toolkit has sections around navigating the health system, staying he healthy, uh, informing participants about their right in health care, and then again, general information about autism, about computer and internet access, and links to reliable medical information. Next slide. Um, also uh, on the on the toolkit are a number of tool of tool of forms and worksheet. Um, these are things that uh, in our in our studies we found participants really. Um, 
value. Um, there's worksheets around making an appointment, around what to bring to a healthcare visit, um, how to describe their symptoms, how to make sure that they're following up with um, all their uh, all the, the things that has been recommended. Next slide. And then the centerpiece of the toolkit is what we call our Autism Healthcare Accommodations Toolkit, or AHAT for short. Um, this is um, but this is a tool that helps um, participants get the accommodations they need. Um, the participant or their supporter fills out a survey uh, focusing on how they communicate, what supports the, uh, supporters there are in their lives, and all sorts of um, possibilities around accommodations and strategies. Um, the computer then takes this information and creates a personalized report for providers. Um, and this is inter you know what's interesting is that it actually took us way more time to find a, a, a report that providers would read than anything else. But we do feel like we've gotten some that is very provider friendly in terms of focusing on the actionable things they can um, most do to facilitate care. Next slide. This is an example of the format of it. You'll see there's, there's, there's particular topics and then there's bulleted lists of very practical things a provider might do for this particular patient, which may be different than what they would need to do for a different patient. Next slide. Um, we tested our toolkit with 170 autistic adults, um, and we found that the vast majority found that the material was important, useful, and easy to understand. And what I was most excited about is a month after using the toolkits, we were um, um, participants reported fewer barriers to healthcare, greater healthcare self-efficacy, and improved um, participant provider communication. Now, of course, that was just a, a pre-post test, and we're now currently doing a, a controlled study with a, with, um, within three health systems to see how this will work in in, in integrating it into health systems. Um, ultimately, the idea is that participants can use the AHAT to consider their accommodation needs and how to, and how to communicate about them um, and how to improve their self-advocacy. This also helps providers understand and more, be more receptive to reasonable accommodations. Um, and um, we've been very careful to make sure that the reports are easily shared with providers and staff or case managers or anyone else who may use them. Next slide. So, I've talked about a lot of things today. I think the, the most important take-home points is autism is really common in adulthood. Again, estimated to be about 1% of the population. And even though many of those are undiagnosed, the large cohort of diagnosed children are now reaching adulthood. Um, there's many opportunities for health, the healthcare system to improve our capability to provide adequate care for adults on the autism spectrum. Um, there are tools, and I said I'd love for you guys to um, use the tools that we've made. They've been publicly funded and are available for free um, because we really do um, believe that um, it's important to um, to have uh, greater healthcare experiences for our autistic participants. Um, and of course, there's still lots and lots of work to be done, and I'm hoping that we can push at a whole system to improve um, um, the, the, the health and the well-being of autistic adults. Um, ultimately, addressing their, the health care needs can make a really huge difference in the lives um, of, uh, of autistic individuals. Um, I very much appreciate your um, uh, you're uh, listening, and I also appreciate the um, incredible work that's been done by my uh, Aspire Healthcare partner, um, Aspire um, to team, including both of our academic partners and our autistic partners. Thank you. Next slide. Dr. Hello? Nicolaitis, I would also like to thank you for your excellent presentation. Um, before I hand it over to Joe Cappuccini from LA Care, I just wanted to talk about slide 44, if you would move on. Um, I wanted to address um, kind of the um, insurance side in order to make it broader than just California. Um, so um, this is a comments about uh, benefits related to persons, um, for autistic persons. All states are mandated to provide ASD service to, services to those under 21 diagnosed with autism. 
though there are some variants by state by state in terms of the breadth of services, and I'm referring to Medicaid benefits here. If the participant continues to need ASD services after the age of 21, they are generally referred to adult DDID service centers and or providers, and the coverage can vary by individual states. Assuming the ASD benefit is incorporated in the MCO contracts, such as those participants in the dual eligibility demonstrations, they are generally served by the health plan's behavioral health network. So I'll now hand it over to Joe Cappuccini from LA Care, who will speak on slide 44 forward. Uh, Christopher, thank you very much. And as a reminder, I'm speaking as proxy for MASA, who is the um, subject matter expert here at LA Care. So uh, Christopher, thank you for inviting us. And, and Dr. Nikolai, just thank you very much for your interesting information. I found it, um, your passion and your, your delivery was uh, very attention getting, so I want to thank you for that. Um, I want to go back to the previous slide, if you would, for a moment, please, and I want to kind of subsidize something that Christopher had mentioned. Uh, first, let's go ahead and cover the first um, bullet point up to the age of 21, yes. The autism spectrum disorder services are considered Medicaid covered benefits managed by the health plan. But I want to add an additional bit of information that Christopher, we did not include on this particular slide. And that is, if the member needs more ASD-like services, for example, applied behavioral analysis, the beneficiary is referred to local disability service centers. For instance, here in LA, we refer to that, or we call those local service disability service centers, we call them regional centers. So I just kind of wanted to, to kind of backfill that previous slide that Christopher had alluded to previously. So thank you for that. Let's now go to the next slide. And I'll give you an overview of who we are here at LA Care Health Plan. Um, we are the largest national publicly operated Medicaid health plan, and we've been servicing Los Angeles County specifically since 1997. Um, we've identified our mission to provide access to quality health care for LA County's vulnerable and low income communities, as well as residents in order to support the safety net required to, to achieve those purposes. It's our legacy that we have built by developing new programs, fostering innovative partnerships, and exploring ways to provide better care at a reduced cost. Next slide, please. So when we talk about LA Care's ASD program, in late summer of 2014, we'd identified the need for a specific program to meet the needs of providers as well as medicated participants as they assume the responsibility of autism services. So as you, as you already know, most current ASD program staff are former ASD practitioners. So a variety of perspectives allows our staff to better understand and meet the needs and challenges of the participants. And just to review some of the key elements of the ASD program, we do apply open communication. It is an evolving and updating resource and process, resources, processes. And it is requiring a continuous training as far as attention to updates, both medical um, and, and regulatory. Next slide, please. The LA Care staff within the ASD program include five board-certified behavioral anal um, analysts whose responsibility it is to review the treatment plans, determine the eligibility, as well as ensuring the coordination of care. We have one dedicated court care coordinator that addresses the emails, as well as the phone calls coming from the community, the hospitals, the vendors, as well as other multiple entities. We have one regional center liaison who, who addresses any issues and concerns that are related to regional center services as well as physician provider groups or what we call PPGs, such as occupational and physical therapy, speech language pathologist services, et cetera. We have assembled a team, a dedicated team, 
a specialized, provide, a specialized provider network team that focuses on the onboarding the new physician provider groups and supporting them with business and administrative matters. We do that on our end. Next slide, please. As far as the functional behavioral assessment is concerned, once we receive the request for autism services and receipt of a diagnosis from a physician or a licensed psychologist, the participant is then referred to an applied behavioral analyst, analysis, analyst, and that are and a specialist for a standard functional behavior assessment, which includes indirect assessment as well as direct assessment the interviewing of the caregiver where that behavior occurs, the observing of the participant in their own environment, and then working with the participant to find out the strengths and weaknesses in their communication or motor skills, their play skills, and their adaptive and social skills. Next slide, please. As we continue through the behavioral assessment, the goals are designed to operationally define the behavior and measuring the baseline level by identifying the, the frequency of the behavior, how often it happens, the duration of the behavior, how long it lasts, and then the intensity of the behavior. Is it mild, moderate, or severe? We also continue the assessment to determine the reasons why the participant is engaging in the problem behaviors, also known as identifying the function of the behavior. Then we design evidence-based treatment plans to address the identified problem behaviors and or developmental delays. And then we continue on by recommending goals and ABA-based treatments to the health plan. Next slide, please. As far as evidence-based treatments for autism are concerned, applied behavioral analysis is a scientific discipline concerned with the understanding and improvement of human behavior in homes, clinics, schools, and many other settings. The goal is to develop effective ABA-based treatments that will support improving problem behavior socially significant in the members' lives. The following behavioral health treatments are the primary behavioral interventions that have been identified as evidence-based. They are, first, comprehensive treatments. Now, these treatments are usually provided intensively at home or in center-based programs for an average of 36 months. And then there's focus-based treatments, and those are designed to address specific behaviors, including aggression, self-injury, disruptive or other challenging behaviors. And they commonly include caregiver training and averages 10 to 25 hours a week for a short period of time. Now, it's important to note that these treatments are all gathered under the ABA umbrella. Next slide, please. As an ASD provider network, LA CARES ABA provider network consists of over 70 in-network ABA providers. An additional Memorandum of Understanding or MOU-based ABA providers and licensed psychologists for second opinions. All of the ABA participants referred to by providers have access to a local psychological service or beacon for testing and other mental health services such as talk therapy, medication, etc. Care coordination, which is one of the key elements of our ASD program at LA Care, it's our in-house staff ensures the integration between providers and services such as 
occupational and physical therapy services, and speech language pathology services. Both, both services provided as medically necessary. Next slide, please. Now we transition participants to adult services. Prior to a participant turning 21, the needs are identified for continuing services. A care coordinator will refer the individual to a local disability service center. If adult behavior health services are required, for example, talk therapy or marriage family therapy, psychiatric supports, that participant is referred to the planned behavioral health network to determine the eligibility and identify the providers. Providers can then engage with local disability service centers or health plans in order to determine the eligibility for those adults who previously received autistic services as children. Next slide, please. A question had been posed to us as well as others, what did we learn? Well, the lessons that LA Care learned transitioning participants to adult services is to initiate early planning in order to eliminate and minimize the gaps in service. And we do that by identifying ongoing participant needs after the age of 21. We find a way to refer the participant to the appropriate service networks or the, 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 the DSC or the Behavioral Health Network. And we facilitate the transfer of the participant records. We take ownership of that. During the early planning, we prepare the participant and their families for differing eligibility criteria and benefits between the DSCs and us at LA Care. Now, oftentimes, we run into questions and concerns about differing eligibility criteria and benefits, and then we and the DSC have identified personnel to facilitate that transition, a conduit, a liaison, someone that may translate insurance-heavy lingo into understandable, easy-to-understand layman language. And we do a pretty good job of it at the start, but it's always nice to have that third party. Next slide, please. Additionally, um, more lessons that we've learned as far as developing the program, gain management and leadership support. Buy-in from above is crucial to the program's success, and we have it here. Our leadership identified dedicated staff to help us develop and deliver the autism program we've just discussed. Additionally, Policies and procedures were designed that clinically, ethically, and medically put the participant first. Why? Because we want to ensure flexibility to accommodate that participant's needs. We want to be open and we, we strive to be open to new information such as clinical information, guidelines, policies, regulations, ad infinitum and we're constantly developing and updating effective workflows, process, as well as staff training to optimize consistency. So that being said, on behalf of MASA, myself, and all of the dedicated staff in our behavioral health department at LA Care, we want to thank you for the information and your time and attention. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate that very much. Well, well presented. Um, I would like to now apologize to the larger group that um, we have successfully eaten up over half the time for the Q&A. But please keep them coming in because we will respond to you. If we don't get to them all online here, we will respond to you separately. I promise that. An interesting question has come in that I wanted to ask. It's from... Um, um, an ambulance service. It's actually um, a Dr. End from an ambulance service in Washington State. Um, this is the second time we've gotten questions from an ambulance service, so I'm pleased that they're beginning to get engaged with this. The tools, do tools exist to, ed to help educate ambulance providers or EMS professionals in accommodating autistic adults 
and kids given urgent situations? I think that's a question best for uh, Dr. Nicolaitis. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. And um, this has come up multiple times. I'm not aware right now of tools specifically aimed at emergency personnel, um, but I – so, and, and I have to say, I was an EMT for years and years before going to medical school. <laughs> I really completely appreciate this and understand um, how much it's, it's needed. Um, I would say that we're much of what's in the toolkit for primary care really could be also helpful for, um, for emergency personnel. Um, because this was a research a study we had to be very specific, and we did it specifically for the primary care system, but I would say, you know, 80% of the information would also be useful for um, uh, yeah, for um, people in the EMS uh, system. That being said, I think it's an important need, and we certainly have it on our list of things to do to try to make uh, supplements that are specifically for uh, EMS. Great. Thank you very much. Marissa um, from Anthem Health Plan, can you provide a little more detail as to why diagnoses of women, including those of color, have a lower diagnostic rate than those of men? If either I, you could respond to that, yeah. That's probably mine too. Um, yes, so, I agree. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question. I don't know that we have a 100% answer. Part of it is the logical thing, that diagnoses in general – um, especially for people of color, are you know are, are going to be lower because of lower access rates, because of the many many social determinants of health where we find that there are disparities um, in healthcare um, uh, practices for for people of color. Um, I, I work with Dr. Zuckerman, uh, who who specifically focuses on Latina individuals, and we've found that there's both an issue of access to health care and then there's also uh, potentially within the community different ideas of or even awareness of what autism may be, so, so a combination of factors. When it comes to girls, that's, that's trickier. Um, and my personal opinion is that m much of the of our image of autism has been focused on how it presents in males and we find that there are some gender differences. Um, so when we've created a, a kind of, when you've created a definition that is based on the characteristics that are more commonly seen in in males, it then kind of becomes a self fulfilling prophecy where we don't see it as easily and we don't recognize it as easily in in girls. Um, and we find that girls have you know, who, who are diagnosed have more severe intellectual disabilities. They have, they, they are diagnosed at older ages. Um, we're, again, many of us are very interested in this topic and are working on it, and there's new research on it. My own speculation would be that 10 years from now, we're going to have a very different di definition of what autism even is for any gender, and that it will hopefully also be a little bit more inclusive of how it presents in women. Um, but it is it is an ongoing uh, issue of of great concern right now in the in the research world. Thank you both very much for the presentation. I appreciate it. I have learned a lot just speaking for myself. Um, at this point, I, I need to hand it over to Jesse to wrap things up. Thank you, Chris. And yes, thank you to our presenters today. Um, Dr. Nicolaitis and um, particularly her Aspire team, the funders of which are listed on this slide here. And of course to our presenters from LA Care, Masa Hasari, thank you for your work, and Joe Cappuccini for the presentation today. Um, I also want to remind people to keep sending your questions in. We will be sure to, to address all of them with the help from our presenters uh, going forward so we can get you that accurate information and have those posted. Um, also, we have another webinar next week on palliative and hospice care for adults with disabilities. Please join us at the same time. Um, if you've registered for this webinar, you're registered for that one too. Um, so you can just follow the link um, in the email confirmation that you've received. 
For more information on obtaining those CEUs and CMEs for today, um, you can follow uh, the link um, to CMS Learning Management System, and we have all of that information at our Resources for Integrated Care website. Um, as always, your feedback is very important um, and essential to developing new trainings and resources. So there will be a brief survey that will appear automatically on your screen when this webinar ends, and you can send any additional comments that you have, as always, to our inbox at ric at lewin.com. That's ric at lewin.com. Thank you again, everyone, for your time today, and have a great rest of your day.